we're going to get started. I am extremely honored to be joined by our special guest, Rima Mismar. Rima is the executive director of AFAQ and has been since 2016. Um, she joined the organization in 2011. Before joining AFAQ, Rima established herself as a well-respected film critic and writer focusing on film. Um, she's worked briefly in television. She's served on many committees and juries for film festivals. Um, Rima completed her studies in uh, communication arts at LAU in Beirut in 1998. Rima, thank you so much for joining Africa Conversations. Thank you for having me, Mikey. Glad to be among uh, this group of people and uh, happy to hear from them and to share with them what we are doing. Yeah, we're honored that you are um, able to share the work that AFAQ is doing right now. Um, I think a good place to start is uh, for those people on the call who may not be familiar with AFAQ, um, I think it serves some purpose to read its vision as stated on the website because I think it undergirds a lot of the work that you are doing right now. It says, a fox strives to build a flourishing cultural and artistic scene across the Arab region that contributes to establishing open and vibrant societies where young and seasoned voices engage with each other in the wake of massive transformations being witnessed by the region. Um, we are witnessing a massive transformation, a, a violent a transformation um, in Beirut right now. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this vision is really informing the work that you guys are doing over at Afak right now and have been doing for probably the last, um, since October really? Um, I think that, I mean, when, when the organization was set up in 2007, um, the idea was exactly to support um, creative uh, expression across the Arab region. Um, and it was very much the whole idea of setting up AFAQ was very much uh, um, uh, initiated with, with, with the idea in mind that there is, uh, that arts and culture are not a priority across the Arab region in terms of uh, government's agendas. Uh, and that yeah. there is very little support, uh, even in the few Arab countries that do have public support or where the public sector is active in supporting arts and culture, it's still not sufficient and in many cases um, uh, treated as a luxury and not as something that is really part of uh, how societies evolve and, and, and how, uh, how progress is measured as well. Um, to be totally honest with you, I mean, the kind of work that we have been doing since October 2019, and specifically um, within Lebanon, because it is it has been a focus since then, um, not to, of course, uh, forget the rest of the region that is still, I mean, um, facing different challenges depending on the different contexts. But I mean, the, the kind of crisis in, in the region is really ongoing and on different scales in the different Arab countries. But I, I would would not say that uh, uh, the kind of emergency support that we are thinking about right now is something that was part and parcel of our vision. Uh, mm -hmm. Our vision was mainly to uh, focus on creative expression and the kind of, of uh, interventions that we do uh, that sometimes complement the kind of uh, 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 annual programs through which we support artists and organizations, uh, these kind of special interventions are still uh, under the umbrella of uh, developing uh, or contributing to supporting creative expression. But finding ourselves, especially after the August uh, 4th catastrophe in a place where we have to step in uh, to actually uh, uh, fill the gap that should be filled by, by the government is something uh, that we did not, I mean, we did not envision at the very beginning. But of course, I mean, throughout the history through which we have been uh, operational for 14 years now, uh, we did see in different, uh, at different stages that uh, the needs are so vast and yes. uh, the kind of, of work that we do could be easily stretched into areas that connect to culture, of course, but that is not always just focused on the creative, uh, uh, the creation of artists and, and, uh, uh, and cultural uh, practitioners. Yes. So this is, I mean, just to say that... Uh, 
I mean, despite all the work that we feel responsible and despite the responsibility that we feel towards the arts and culture community in Lebanon and across the Arab region, we would rather have not uh, put ourselves in a place where we have to replace governments, where we have to replace cultural policies, where we, where we have to uh, think of, of ways to sustain uh, artists and organizations just in their survival. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, when, when you see that there's a total absence of initiative uh, now, but also, I mean, during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, which is still ongoing, but because of, because of the frequency of crises and because of the sizes of these crises, one just uh, 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 tends to, uh, to engulf the other and we become yeah. in a state of emergency within emergency within emergency. Um, so we are, I mean, we are uh, uh, completely uh, trying to uh, stick uh, to, to, to our vision, to our raison d'etre, why we are here. We are here to support the arts and culture yeah. community. And in times of crisis such as the one that Lebanon is facing now, specifically in relation to the catastrophe of August 4, uh, we had no choice but to step in and tend to the community that we uh, we service uh, and try to think of ways to just make it hold together uh, while being able to keep a strategic vision as well. Because the last thing that we want as uh, organizations uh, working in this field is to actually find ourselves in a constant um, uh, mode uh, of of, uh, of emergency, because this, yeah, uh, in a way, does take away from uh, the more strategic or long term vision of what exactly we want to support and and yeah. which voices. Yeah, it's a balance of like uh, strategic action and tactical action. There's there's time for responses and there's times for uh, strategy. Can you, um, for those of the people on the call or those listening. Um, would you mind giving a sort of uh, a high level helicopter view of um, what the major challenges are? Um, you know, you alluded to this idea, um, you alluded to the catastrophe in August, August 4th, um, but a lot of the, you know, the culture sector in Lebanon and most of the economy in Lebanon has been on life support long, long since then. Um, can you give a, a high level uh, view of the challenges that the whole sector is facing right now and how you, how a fuck is trying to step in. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, well, let, let me start. I mean, even before the August 4th uh, uh, catastrophe and not only in Lebanon, but also looking at the region because we are I mean, very keen on always putting things in perspective across the Arab region because we are a regional uh, organization. Yeah. Um, the, the thing is that uh, with what we have been facing, if, if I mean, if we consider COVID-19, uh, the, the outbreak of COVID-19, which is, which, has, which is affecting the whole world, uh, World and, and including the whole Arab region, uh, what the baseline that we can, I mean, start from uh, to, to, to discuss a bit or to talk about uh, what we are doing and why is uh, the fact that the arts and culture factor, uh, uh, sector is vulnerable. It's always been vulnerable, and it's yeah. vulnerable because uh, there is uh, uh, there's no uh, it, it's not a priority, as I said, in any of, of the strategies, governments, uh, agendas. I mean, not at all. Uh, the second reason is that uh, with the grants that most of the organizations, uh, if we are speaking about structures, because these are the I mean the infrastructure of of the arts and culture sector in the different Arab countries, uh, if we we speak of arts and cultural organizations, uh, most of them survive on grants. Mm -hmm. And surviving on grants, meaning that most of the funding is coming actually earmarked for specific activities and projects. Yeah. So we know these. We know that most of the artists are freelance artists. Uh, we know that they do not have any social uh, uh, network, uh, uh, social security networks. Uh, they don't have uh, any kind of uh, insurance. I mean, nothing yeah. to really fall back social on in net. times of, of, of yeah. not at all. Yeah. And so we know this. But what, what happens is that in, in times of crisis, uh, these 
these vulnerabilities become much more magnified. Yeah. And this is where, I mean, the call for immediate action becomes uh, really urgent and that we find ourselves needing and, and, and having to step in one way or the other. So yeah. coming back to, uh, to, to Lebanon, uh, the discussions uh, across the uh, arts and culture sector started as early as October 2019, because yeah. it was a moment uh, where, uh, uh, I mean, of course, the, 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 we as people uh, who do work on orga in organizations, but we, I mean, as individuals uh, who are dreaming of, of a better country, of uh, a more transparent system, of a non-corrupt, uh, uh, non-corrupt me mechanisms. So the individual comes first and in, in, uh, came first in October 2019. But then little by little, we also found ourselves as people who work in the arts and culture sector, coming together, thinking collectively, reflecting on what's happening, sharing challenges, and mostly uh, probably thinking of what is it or how can we reimagine really the work that we do uh, post this, uh, I mean, period of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the uprisings and uh, yeah. October 2019. And this was a very, uh, this was a milestone in terms of feeling that things cannot continue the, w the way that they were before and that there's something that we need to reimagine together to actually be able to uh, put forward the kind of cultural life that we want to see. How do we want to build this cultural life? And so just when these kind of discussions were happening and then uh, AFAQ and in partnership with uh, Cultural Resource or al Maurid al thaqafi another regional uh, support organization based in Beirut, together we decided that there is a need uh, to actually do some sort of an action uh, because of what we have been seeing and discussing. And yeah. the first discussion started in January 2020, even before, uh, just to say that this all started before COVID-19. And the idea at the time was that we were saying that there, there is one year that could be a transitional phase uh, whereby organizations need to be supported in order to uh, survive uh, the bank restrictions, uh, survive the uh, cancellation of activities and therefore whatever funding they had uh, for those uh, activities, uh, mm -hmm. being able to retain their teams because and their spaces because, I mean, they, have, they either have some money in the banks that they are not able to access or they have money that has been pledged uh, but now uh, earmarked for activities and with the uh, uh, situation back then, it was impossible to hold any activities. So for all of those yeah. reasons, we decided uh, along with our partner, Culture Resource, to launch the Solidarity Fund for Arts and Culture Structures in Lebanon. The call went out in May 2020 and uh, uh, 75 uh, organizations or structures, we, sh we say structures because it, the, the, the kind of of uh, entities that we were supporting do not have to be registered. Uh, they could be collectives, yeah, so they could be in, uh, social enterprises. Uh, and so the yeah. whole idea was to actually support those structures uh, during this economic crisis uh, to be able to survive and think of ways to reinvent themselves. Because so, obviously, yeah, go ahead. Let me ask, let me ask you a question. Um, as, because Afak in many ways is sort of this intermediary, right? Um, you, you as an organization are going to other funders and you're on the ground, you're very plugged in. And so um, from what I understand, you're going to other funders and saying, this is important, this matters. If you care about this region, if you care about society at large, if you care about progress, you should care about this. You should care about um, sort of white collar organizations and, and um, you know, structures, these sort of un, um, uh, unregistered structures. They are all, all part of this ecosystem. Yeah. yeah, all registered. I mean, exactly. both. Both. Um, is that message resonating more now than it was before um, w in the sort of the international uh, sort of funding landscape as well as a local landscape? Are you, you know, as a fuck, uh, is that message being heard? I guess that's what my, my question. Are people understanding I, that they're uh, sort of a diversity of organizations? 
Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, to, to a very to a good extent, it's being hurt. And of course, I mean, yeah. it's part of our role as intermediary and supporting organizations to also somehow educate uh, whoever wants to support. Because, I mean, you know, there are very specificities to the context where we are in. There are There is an Arab context, but then there are contexts within this yeah. wider context. And so being able to always, um, uh, the approach that we usually take is very bottom up. So mm -hmm. the kind of programs that we launch, that we uh, uh, spearhead, are very much uh, in, in response to uh, our continuous uh, observation and engagement with mm -hmm. the arts and culture sector across the Arab region. It's, these are not programs that we decide we want to uh, just launch because uh, we have funding for that. Yeah. We, re we, we analyze the needs on the ground and then we work accordingly. But in times of crisis, uh, I mean, what what I mean, what's good is that people feel a sense of urgency to move, and I mean, yeah. supporters and and givers and so on. But at the same time, there is something that is uh, how how can I put it in a nice way? Uh, there's something in this mode of emergency uh, <laughs> that that actually strips uh, the the. The, the the cultural and artistic work that has been that is being done since years in the region yeah. from its uh, agency in the sense that this becomes uh, important and urgent only because there is an explosion only because there yeah. is covid-19 only because there is a, a crisis in the banking system in lebanon and so this is where uh, i mean the, the the burden becomes i mean on our shoulders to actually keep balancing between these immediate needs and this more strate more strategic yeah. uh, uh, vision uh, for support and we don't want to lose any i mean we we realize the importance of, of 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 being able to step in at a certain moment to fill a certain gap but ultimately what we want to do what what why we do this kind of uh, emergency support is to safeguard this community or this yeah. landscape of artistic and cultural production for the strategic and long-term vision that we have, which is basically yeah. seeing uh, uh, creative expression as a virtual space where uh, uh, critical thinking is developed, where the public is informed, where uh, taboo uh, uh, topics could be discussed. And I mean, between political discourse and mainstream media, a lot is lost and, and yeah. a lot is being reduced into something that is dangerously uh, simplistic or even uh, a truth being uh, uh, converted. And so our, our uh, vision of this arts and culture or culture production in general is its ability to uh, navigate uh, those lines with a lot more complexity and with, without compromise. Uh, so this is, I mean, why it's important to support in such times, because we want to make sure that in a year from now, uh, those spaces, those artists and those culture practitioners are able to continue their contribution to the civic space that we live yeah. in and to widen the discussions that happen at the social, political and uh, uh, humanistic level. Yeah. Um, before the call uh, started, you and I were talking briefly, and you um, you brought up this uh, a notion that I find very interesting. This uh, the notion between loss and damage, um, and uh, so these you know these five photos are photos of art spaces, culture spaces, Sirsot uh, 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 Museum on top, very similar in the bottom left corner, and Studio Safar in the bottom right corner. Um, and you started talking about this concept of damage and loss um, and the dichotomy between the two um, in reference to these photos. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because um, I think for me, I found it quite ca captivating. Uh, I mean, damage is the very direct uh, uh, assessment of, of physical damage, be it physical yeah. injury, be it uh, uh, damage in, in the structures, in the buildings, and in, in, uh, even in the material assets of, of an org organization or an artist or a cultural practitioner. Yeah. Losses is something that goes beyond this to actually look at what has this uh, catastrophe uh, uh, caused at the level of what was supposed to happen? So if, yeah. I mean, how, how does this catastrophe affect uh, 
what you are doing in a year, in six months from now, a year or probably two years. We yeah. know that a lot of, uh, if we speak about uh, uh, structures or organizations or galleries, spaces, all of these definitely do have like a, a, a year, a calendar year whereby they have uh, exhibitions that are being booked and prepared, artists yeah. that they are, that, and there are a lot of networks that are involved in these. So it's not only the gallery and the artist, but it's also the so family the effect, yeah. who, who, whom this artist support, but also the technicians and so on. And then when, when something like this happens, and then you have also funding that could be uh, connected to this. So the loss is, the damage is that the space now is not functional. The loss is uh, my whole plan for 2021 is not uh, going to happen now. So there are people who are going to lose their livelihoods because of this. There yeah. is uh, funding or support that we are not able to retrieve because uh, we cannot do this specific activity uh, for which we had uh, funding or sponsorship or or. And this idea of loss is what actually uh, goes beyond Beirut, uh, yeah. despite the fact that the effort that we are doing now with Al Maurid is basically focusing on the Beirut arts and culture community, and specifically the community that was in the uh, uh, direct vicinity of the explosion. When we speak of losses, then these losses resonate across the whole of Lebanon, but also across the Arab region, because as part yeah. of what Beirut represents, or not only Beirut and other Arab cities, it's not only it, it's not only a place where uh, where uh, Lebanese artists are endorsed. It's not only a place where Lebanese artists are being exhibited and invited and so on, but it's rather also an outlet for uh, many artists, especially Arab artists across the region or who are living in diaspora. So this kind of assessment of the loss will. Take Take much more time and it's more, much more qualitative in that yeah, sense uh, whereas at the level of damages right now we are looking at uh, the more the quantitative direct uh, uh, damage which has hit uh, the walls the windows the glass uh, the laptop the, the equipment and so yeah. on what are what are some of the major um Sort of roadblocks for you right now. Uh, you know, what does the next sort of three months look like uh, for you organizationally, um, specifically on this front? Um, there, I would imagine that there's some sort of you know quantification, uh, qualification period. Um, there must be a lot of fundraising. Um, you know, what are some of the major challenges and roadblocks that you're dealing with right now? And who are the stakeholders as well? Sorry. Who are the Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to just go uh, uh, backwards a, a minute just to put things in perspective. So yes. uh, before the explosion and as part of the emergency support scheme that we uh, launched this year, one was mm -hmm. the Solidarity Fund for Arts and Culture Structures in Lebanon, yeah. also in partnership with Al Maurit, um, and yeah. through which we, were, we wanted to support organizations just to overcome the economic crisis. Uh, yeah. I mean, sarcastically, we, uh, we announced the results of, of this fund in, uh, on July 30, which yeah. is just four days before the explosion. And through this fund, we were able to support the 23 organizations across Lebanon, not only in Beirut, uh, with um, funding of around $845,000. So this was a program that we had the time to uh, to actually uh, uh, develop, uh, design, fundraise for, and then once everything was ready, we just opened the call, received uh, applications, and had the jury to decide yeah. on who will get the grant. And but in parallel, yeah, yeah, for people on the call who are not in Lebanon, that's roughly an eight-month turnaround because we're talking about mid October to the end of July. Um, no, I mean now, actually, yeah. the call the call was uh, was launched in May, yeah. and the results uh, were announced on July thirtieth. Yeah. Just I mean, uh, uh, twenty five days ago, and yeah. three days before the explosion. Uh, and in parallel, we also uh, uh, launched the artist support grant, which was yeah. more in in response to uh, COVID nineteen and what how it affected uh, uh, adversely impacted artists. And this was a regional. Uh, uh, program through which we supported 178 artists 
uh, artists in all uh, different practices with a one-time uh, sabbatical grant of $3,000. So, I mean, we just finished mm -hmm. those and then the explosion uh, happened. Um, for the first time, probably in the history of this organization, and I, I assume as well in the history of, uh, of Maurid uh, Culture Resource, uh, we decided to do things backwards. Yeah. We always take a distance from what's happening, take our time to reflect properly, uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, what we are doing is meaningful and that it will resonate in the long term. But mm -hmm. in this specific moment, after the, uh, uh, the explosion, uh, we started also receiving uh, uh, messages and emails from partners, from people in the Arab region and beyond, asking how they can support. Looking at the, uh, I mean, at, at the impact of, of the explosion, we felt that we do not have the luxury of waiting this time. Yeah. So let's uh, make use of an existing platform, which is the Lebanon Solidarity Fund. We launch it as a fundraising campaign for now, because obviously we don't have the money. It's not something that we have been prepared to, and we should never be prepared for something like this. Uh, and, and we started, so we just, launched the fundraising campaign and and in parallel we started doing the work on the ground yeah. and the, by the work on the ground i mean looking at what are the areas of support that we need to attend to at this point what are the focus areas of support and what is the mechanism to do that while as well uh, uh, contacting and reaching out to our existing partners, new partners, uh, coordinating with the different initiatives that are happening on the ground, because there's a lot happening and it's definitely a good sign. Uh, we are just keen on coordinating so that the different initiatives are able to support as wide a network of artists and spaces as possible. So yeah. where we are right now is uh, we have, uh, I mean, some donations that we are receiving online, very small amounts, very touching messages of artists that, let's say, got a grant from AFAT last year and now decided to give back this grant so that it can support an artist in Lebanon who is much in uh, much more in need right now at, at the level of, of creating art or just I mean, finding a shelter. Yeah. Um, and and uh, we are also in discussions with our main partners. And by main partners, I mean those longstanding supporters, uh, Open Society Foundations, Drosus Foundation, Ford Foundation, um, Dune uh, Foundation, and others, Prince Klaus Fund, uh, European Culture Foundation. Uh, and we are, what we are trying to do is basically to act as a mediator yeah. uh, at the level of receiving those funds, uh, funds and channeling them uh, to the community, but also coordinating with the other initiatives that are happening in Lebanon regionally and internationally to see where the overlaps are, uh, knowing that the needs are so huge that uh, probably uh, uh, four uh, initiatives like the one that we are doing with Al Maurid would not be uh, enough to support. Um, on the ground, uh, we have been discussing a lot uh, what can, how, how to do this. Um, and there were, um, I mean, a number of uh, concerns and sensitivities that we wanted to make sure that we are respecting. Number one, uh, the catastrophe is, I mean, happened like yesterday. Yeah. Uh, and so this means that we have to be really careful when uh, asking, I mean, if we want to support people, people, specifically uh, individuals, we have to be very mindful about the process. There, this yeah. is not the time for applications, for definitely not the time to ask them to submit any projects. It's just a time for us to stand in solidarity with them. And in solidarity means that mm -hmm. what is it exactly that they need at this point in time, in this minute now, just for them to be able to uh, uh, continue in the coming two or three months. Yeah. And so we've identified uh, supporting individual artists and organizations as two main areas of support. For artists, we are looking at those who had uh, lost their homes, uh, workspaces, studios, and equipments. Mm -hmm. uh, for organizations, we are looking at uh, um, the, the main, very, I mean, first assessment is um, includes emergency reconstruction to ensure safety of premises and assets or rental in case 
of temporary relocation when property is lost or severely damaged. Yeah. We are looking at the protection, housing and transfer of collections, uh, be it digital archives or material ones, uh, rehabilitation of premises at the level of furniture, uh, computers, laptops, um, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, as well the uh, infrastructure networks of electricity and, and, and internet. So yeah. these are the immediate needs that individuals now, I mean, need and that organizations need. Now, how to do this and how to actually um, uh, do the process, we had to start from scratch. Yeah, I um, imagine. In the different countries where, I mean, there is a presence of for the public sector where there are syndicates that work properly, you have a lot of data that you can build on and start from there. In our part of the world, unfortunately, yeah. none of this data is existent. I mean, we have our database as AFAC, which, I mean, houses a lot of information about artists across the Arab region. But when it comes to, let's say, uh, receiving, I mean, someone sends me a name of an artist. I don't know this art, what this, if I don't know them, I don't know what they do. I don't have a syndicate to go back to and see whether they are, I mean, people who are really practicing uh, this kind of art or profession or, or, or. Yeah. So we started with the, I mean, networks around us, uh, collect collecting data and collating lists. Whoever yeah. is working on like uh, sectorial initiatives, we, there is the theater uh, relief fund, there is uh, um, uh, uh, an initiative for musicians, another one for uh, film people uh, uh, by Beirut DC. All of these are now, we are in discussions, putting together these lists and developing forms. Uh, right now, the first phase of support, uh, we have identified at least 200 artists who had been either injured, e either or, and or. Uh, so uh, physically injured, uh, damaged houses, yeah. damaged equipments, um, um, uh, damaged workspaces or, or studios. These are at least 200. Um, and for the organizations, uh, we have collected so far the first, uh, I mean, the preliminary list of 64 uh, mm -hmm. organizations slash spaces, venues, uh, co-working spaces that had been as well um, uh, damaged to different extents. I mean, damage could be somewhere between 10% uh, and 70%. Um, yeah. And we are trying, what we are trying to do as well is to actually, we worked with um, uh, engineers, architects and civil engineers uh, to develop forms, especially for spaces and organizations, so that we are able also to have this da data and see what we can support and what we can't. Yeah. Uh, and this is phase yeah. one. So we are trying to also look strategically, I mean, I, I don't think that, I mean, if we are to be reasonable and uh, uh, realistic, I don't think that uh, anything that is any close to normal could be back in place before a year from now. Yeah. So what, how can we look at this year or year and a half and define phases? So if the first phase is to actually have the windows and have a shelter and have a safe space, the second phase would be resuming work what is it that you need to resume work and how does COVID-19 factor into this and the third phase is actually how do we envision what cultural life do we envision uh, in Lebanon and how to rebuild according to that uh, our main concern is um with the many players on the ground, uh, uh, many damage assessment, rapid, rapid damage assessment committees coming from different organizations, international ones, we know that because of the vulnerability of the arts and culture sector, that it might be just, it, it might fall into the cracks. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, we are making sure that this sector is being, I mean, on the table uh, for, for any discussion that considers, I mean, uh, future uh, support to it, uh, and uh, uh, number two, uh, we, we really believe in the importance of a holistic approach. What yeah. we are looking at right now is a, social, is a whole uh, urban cultural fabric and, yeah. and, and a whole cultural life whereby 
the, the, the stakeholders are not only museums, they are not only individual artists, they are not only nonprofits, they are not only commercial galleries, it's everything. Even the, 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 yeah. the heritage buildings that are now endangered in, in, in the areas of Jamezi and Madame Khayil are part of this uh, ecosystem. The artisan shops, the craftsman shop, those who do the framings for the, uh, for the yeah. exhibitions are part of this. So this, I mean, this is vast. And, and this is something that could, could also be looked at within the lens of, of losses. If we yeah. rebuild uh, only museums without attending to the other uh, uh, players and elements in this ecosystem, there's some, I mean, we will lose a lot. But yeah, at the sure. same time, the, the, the canvas is so, uh, um, the spectrum is so wide that we also need to be strategic in terms uh, what can be supported and how. Yeah. And um, very much uh, really uh, underlining the fact, number one, that stepping in to cover for uh, the work that should, done, should be done by governments, this we should not forget it. Uh, we are not doing this in order to conceal any kind of accountability and responsibility. And number two, no matter what we do with our resources as civil society organizations, individuals and collectives who are all working together to create different initiatives, no matter what we do, there's no way that we are able to cover or compensate for the damage that had been done, even just at the physical level. I mean, I'm not talking yeah. about Emotional. the repercussions on, on the emotional and the, but yeah. I mean, really, these are missions that need governments to stand up for. Yeah, uh, and, then, and, and I mean, the, what you're describing, Rima, if, uh, if I can humbly say, is you're describing an entire social contract. You're trying to rebuild a social contract. Um, uh, you're creating, you're essentially acting as an intermediary, you're acting as a, a, a union, you're acting as a syndicate, you're acting as an insurance company, and it's a lot. You're doing an enormous amount, and it's, yeah, and it, I, take my, I take my hat off. I'm, as somebody who lives here, I'm enormously grateful because this is the ecosystem I live in. Um, and so it's an enormous amount of work. Um, it's very important. I want to turn to the questions in the chat um, because uh, we've got a few really good ones. So, um, uh, so far we have Camelia, um, Leia, and Ria, and then uh, Marina. So let's go in that order. Um, Camelia, go ahead. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time. Um, I was wondering, I know that art in some ways can be therapeutic, and I was wondering, and this may be outside of the purview of your mission, but um, if you think there are ways in which arts events, arts projects can kind of take place now to help people um, from a kind of mental, mental health standpoint, a moral standpoint, in terms of their morale, rather. Um, it, it's really hard to determine that, but what we, what I am sure about is basically the resourcefulness of people who work in this field. Um, we have to, and we've always, I mean, as an organization, respected that. We have to really respect um, the, the distance that people need to take, uh, be it individual artists or organizations, in order to rethink. Uh, what their priorities are at this point in time, uh, especially that they had just done that because of COVID-19 and the economic crisis a few months ago, and now they, they find themselves in another situation where they have to actually reconsider and reshuffle their priorities. Uh, I would say that uh, anything that uh, really comes out after a um, considerable amount of thinking and taking distance uh, from what's happening is something that we would all... Uh, uh, endorse and and appreciate uh, what I'm what we are always I mean and this is part of, of the uh, I mean the whole dilemma or not dilemma I mean it's one of the main concerns across the arts and culture sec sector in the Arab region that because of the many multiple crises uh, you are you, artists are very sensitive to the fact of finding themselves put in, in a corner where they have to uh, actually uh, 
always uh, speak to these uh, crises and, and, and that uh, they have to be ready to react quickly to the different crises. And what we are trying to do is actually do exactly the opposite, uh, to give the individual artists, the, the organizations, the time and space uh, to, uh, to the, the unstructured time and, and, and space, I would say, to just be able to uh, think through things, identify their priorities on the long, medium, and uh, uh, short, medium, and long term, and then come up with whatever they see fit. So it's not a question of, of uh, from our side, the most important thing is that artists and organizations are not pushed in such times to create or to do uh, something in order to be able to live or to be acknowledged uh, in, in international platforms. Uh, this really needs time and it, it's, it's very personal, it's very individualistic and people, uh, artists react in different, in a myriad of different ways in times of crisis. Some of them just sit back and, and contemplate and reflect. Others feel the urge to do something on the spot. And I think that both uh, should be given the the, the the space to make such decisions for themselves without at any point, uh, especially when it comes from international organizations, as well as local ones, uh, that nothing is mandated or that mm. any kind of support is not being uh, connected uh, to this as a con conditionality. Thanks. Thank Canadian. you. Thanks, Rima. Um, Leia, you're up next. Hi, Rima. Hi, Mikey. Hi. Uh, Hi, Leia. Great to listen to that. Um, Rima, you mentioned and you touched up on the fact that you had to fill a void, kind of, and there was like a complete lack of governmental structures and policies. So I was wondering if that would lead AFAC to change um, kind of the programming or maybe add a kind of policy arm to, to the organization. I mean, I know it's still very early and at the moment everybody's in kind of crisis reaction mode, but with everything you've seen and everything you've had to do in the last few weeks, do you imagine that will happen um, in the coming years? Uh, thank you, Leia. Uh, I mean, you know, um, uh, cultural policies or working on cultural policies has been part of our work, but not directly. We do support as part of our different programs, collectives, groups, organizations that are working on cultural policies in the different Arab countries. Um, I think that, I mean, for AFAC to develop such an arm, uh, first of all, we have to take into consideration that we are not, uh, uh, we are not only active in Lebanon. And so uh, any yeah. kind of approach to this has to always take into consideration the regional dimension. Uh, what I think, and because of, I mean, what I said at the beginning, um, because of, uh, of our work being very much focused and driven by the needs on the ground, I think that uh, discussing cultural policies or the need for cultural policies is definitely the, the title, the big title of phase three if we speak of phase one, phase two, and phase three, I mean, between now and probably a year or a year and a half, I think it comes at the level of phase three. And I think that the most important thing is that we as organizations are part of the collective uh, and the bigger discussion. And yeah. based on that, uh, this would inform us whether what kind of, what the needs uh, that uh, on the ground are and how we can respond to those. And responding to those is not enough for us to just uh, identify them as needs, but also to look at the uh, wider uh, perspective of what AFAC does and how a certain new program or special program or a new arm or a new direction uh, is coherent with the other programs and how it complements them. So, but in the general sense of the word, I think that in most of the Arab region and just by the, in most of the world right now, and just by the mere occurrence of, of COVID-19, we are all in a place where um, a lot of uh, internal reflections and brainstormings are being done. And I mean, having this now in Lebanon as an additional catastrophe and its, its aftermath is definitely something that keeps us uh, Awake, I would say, it makes me, uh, keeps me awake in terms of thinking, okay, so what is it that we are going to do? Are we going to continue the work like we did just as business as usual? Uh, what are the changes that we need to implement? Uh, while bearing in mind that as a uh, supporting organization, I think that 
uh, there's a um, value to a certain kind of stillness um, in the sense that with all the changes that are storming people and organizations, there needs to be in such an organization a certain kind of stillness and uh, consistency for others to actually uh, go crazy and, and think of ideas that are outside the box that we can later on uh, support and cherish and endorse. Yeah. Thanks, Leah, uh, so much. So we have three more questions, uh, Ria, Marina, and Anne Razian. I'm going to change my question from the one that I wrote a bit because you kind of answered it before. Um, when you're talking about the stillness, the stillness that is needed and, and how you need to give the artists that you're talking about, those who need it, some space uh, to, to just do nothing and, and, and just be helped. Uh, but I know from watching um, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, take a different shape in the past few months uh, in the U.S., a lot was done to give uh, the space, the, the platform for um, African-American artists and artists who are, were not African-Americans who wanted to uh, express the anger and frustration they were feeling about what was going on, uh, about what was happening to them. The, give them the platform to do it, and by doing so, uh, selling their work, selling this expression of anger and frustration and, and, and hopelessness and, and hope sometimes, selling it to the highest bidder to in turn feed into their cause. Uh, so what I, what I was asking initially is, uh, I'm sure there are some artists who have been hit hard and who in response are want to produce, have it in them. They, they have something they want to say, and the world needs to hear it. So is there a way where we can help uh, put together these two elements and have these artists that have a lot to say, help, pr help them promote this work, put it on our Instagram accounts, uh, 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 help them auction it throughout what we, you know, where we are and, and the accounts that we run and, and in the platforms where we work. And, and sell their work, sell this work, be it group work or, or individual work that tells their story and also injects some money back into um, the reality of the Lebanese artist, you know? So I guess that's, without adding more pressure to what you were trying to say, you know, <laughs> all we're trying to do is raise some funds, we don't want new ideas. But, uh, I, I saw it happen firsthand in the first time, uh, Black Lives Movement, and, and there was some amazing stuff going on uh, where people gave their Instagram accounts for a month just to African-American artists or artists that were doing work for the Black uh, Lives Matter movement. Uh, just that. They did just that. They promoted their work. That's all they did. Um, so we could mobilize in a way. Uh, thank you. Them. Thank you, Rhea, for your question. Yeah. I mean, we've done this before for uh, women artists, for example, because this is a structural uh, uh, issue uh, that is prevailing. Um, and we did, I mean, something like this that was not, uh, that was not um, pressured by a certain crisis. Um, I think, I mean, the, I, I have a, uh, I can share with you the following. So when we did the COVID-19 uh, relief fund, which is the artist support grant, this $3,000, uh, we said that uh, this $3,000 uh, could go to uh, support a, a work that an artist is continuing to work on. It can support their livelihoods and it can support a new a small project that they might want to do in confinement. So we're not, in that sense, what, I'm, was, what I was trying to say is that artists should not be pressured to produce, and definitely they should not, uh, a kind of, the kind of support that we are giving as an emergency support should not be uh, conditioned on them producing a new work. Now, when someone in such a, a crisis or circumstances want to produce, we do have our other programs. And that's why I'm speaking of balancing the immediate needs with the longer term uh, uh, strategic vision that we have. So we do have programs that are running, running every year. And even this year, and despite the COVID-19 and despite everything, we decided to carry on with those because this is the kind of consistency and continuity 
that we can offer the artists who want to produce. But right. if I am offering an emergency grant, the last thing that I want to do is to ask them to produce. Because, I mean, this is totally up to them. And they can still uh, they could still use this grant to do that. Um, uh, promoting work, uh, auctioning work, this is happening. Um, yeah. What 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 we try? I mean, this is and this happens through platforms that whose uh, whose uh, vision or mission is actually to do this kind of thing. Uh, we are already branching into uh, we're not branching, but we are already going into areas of support that we didn't have to do before. So um, I don't think that it's our even in times of crisis, we have to always be very cognizant of uh, not overlapping with other organizations or structures that who are um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, who's professional, yeah. specialized exactly in, in this kind of, uh, of work. Yeah. And also probably one last uh, uh, point uh, to your question. Uh, we, we understand a lot the sensitivities that artists have. Uh, and we really are keen on, uh, uh, on not even when we have a fundraising campaign. I mean, we are very subtle in doing that because we, we realize that artists are only seen when they are uh, cornered into uh, under a specific uh, kind of uh, injustice. Uh, they are mostly victimized and I mean, across, I mean, uh, intentionally and unintentionally. So even let's say for artists of color, for artists of uh, queer artists, we are very much uh, sensitive to not categorizing even in times of crisis, uh, because I mean, this just ends up in putting uh, those who accepted to be part of this, because I mean, many others are not comfortable in the spotlight, where our, as many others are uh, just being kept in the, in, in the dark because they don't want to be part of something that is very, um, at this point, I mean, very public, very uh, promotional, uh, their mental and, and, and psychological state probably are not at best definitely are not at best. And so for me, I mean, I have nothing against uh, um, such initiatives, but I just don't see it sit with what we do. I, I hope that I answered thank your you. question. Yeah. Allow me on behalf of everyone to thank you so much for the work you're doing. Um, it's enormously important. Um, for those of you who are still looking at the screen, if you want to learn more about Afak, uh, go to ArabCultureFund.org or search Afak on Google, you'll find it. Um, if you follow them on Instagram or on social media, their accounts are very active and very informative. Um, they, uh, you can learn a lot about the, the, the sector, the cultural sector across the whole region, not only just in Lebanon. So Rima, thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time today and doing all the work that you're doing. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for all who joined. Um, and thank you for spreading the word about this kind of work. And please feel free to send uh, uh, through your questions if anyone, I mean, did not have the time to address all of them. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Rima. Thank you, thank you so much.